I'm pleased to present lesson number 10 in a series of 24 lessons on the case for biblical Christianity or Christian evidences, sometimes also referred to as Christian apologetics or defense of the Christian religion. I'm grateful for your continued study of this subject. I encourage you to study more than just taking this course and learn all you can about it and help in the great battle against the forces of unbelief. Sometimes you may hear about creation science. Many people, including many in the Church of Christ, do not understand what creation science is. I believe that the Bible is true, but when we talk about creation science, we're not referring to what the book of Genesis and other parts of the Bible tell us about origins or the creation of things. But we use this term, creation science, to refer to the scientific evidences which support the idea of a sudden creation. And so it's called creation science. I've already covered some of the things that could be counted as creation science. In the previous lesson, for example, I, told, I talked about the evidences within the human body. These are matters which lend support to the idea that the human body was designed and that, as the Bible teaches, the designer and the creator is the Almighty God. I hope that you'll pursue further the study of creation science. And in this lesson, I will use some il more illustrations of the wonders of God's work. Remember the course that you're taking is divided into four major areas. First, God or God's existence. And two, number two, God's work. Number three, God's word. And number four, God's son. In Romans, the first chapter, I hope that you will recall that Paul there wrote concerning the things that God made, that these are demonstrations of the eternal power and Godhead or deity or divinity of Almighty God. These things that we see all around us. And so we're studying some of these matters that remind us that there is a creator and that these things show that there was design and purpose. And all of these things didn't come, none of these things came through just chance. There are some illustrations that I call to your attention now from a book, Why We Believe in Creation and Not in Evolution, by Fred John Meldow and that name is M-E-L-D-A-U. This book is a rather large book, and I have taken just a few things from it to show you that scientists have studied things in nature, and the facts of concerning these things are very convincing concerning the existence of God, and that they are indeed the work of God. The first one I call to your attention is called the railroad worm. Now that is just exactly what it's called, railroad worm. And it's a worm found in South America that has a red light on its head. And it has 11 pairs of greenish yellow lights on its sides, which make it look like a train. Now, why 
is this strange arrangement so important? It's because it tells us as little and seemingly insignificant as it is. It tells us that there is a creator, the railroad worm. So the only possible way to explain this worm that has a red light on its head and 11 pairs of greenish yellow lights on its sides is that God created it. And the second one from Mr. Meldow's book, to which I call your attention, is something that is called the China Mark Moth, exquisitely decorated, and spends its entire caterpillar stage under water. This is so drastically contrary to usual experience that there can be no possible evolutionary chain involved, or no possible evolutionary chain leading up to it or departing therefrom. Why does this creature have this strange life cycle? No one knows, but the answer is God made it so. Number three is the Algerian locust which is able to use its own blood as a weapon. It can shoot like an accomplished Texas gunman, literally from the hip. There is a pore, P-O-R-E, there's a pore or an opening between the first and second joints at the base of the leg. This pore can be opened when danger threatens, and a blistering stream of locust blood ejected to a distance of 20 inches. Why do other locusts not have this strange power if evolution did the job? Obviously, the creature was designed or made that way by the Almighty. The next one is the bombardier beetle, which squirts from its hind end a reddish acid fluid which explodes with a pop as the shot comes into contact with the air. It dissolves into a cloud of bluish smoke, which, hovering like a gas barrage, covers the beetle's retreat. In other words, he lays down a smoke screen. The gas has irritant properties and generally succeeds in putting the enemy to flight. Now, there's a book from which Mr. Meldow took this called Nature Parade, and this is on page 122. He continues and says, This is ingenuity so involved using knowledge of engineering and chemistry so advanced that man cannot duplicate this. It demands creation. In other words, this is one of those creatures which God made that man can observe, but he can't explain without God. No evolutionary hypothesis can explain these things. Number five is a species of blind termites that shoot to kill. Notice they're blind termites. They have a two-lobed gland on the head which contains a fluid that solidifies on being exposed to the air. Imagine that. Although this termite is blind, it possesses a mysterious sense of direction which enables it to fire its lethal syringe as accurately as if it could see. 
This termite discharges his jet right in the face of an invading ant, and the ants that receive the fatal douche run about as if demented or addled. They've been hit in the head, and they usually die. So says Sir J. Arthur Thompson, certainly such uncanny ability cannot be attributed to mere chance. That should be obvious to anyone who is unbiased, who uses good judgment, who thinks. He can see that that could not be the result of pure chance. Let us give credit to whom it credit is due. God designed and created all life in nature. Nature is an, uh, an overwhelming demonstration of the genius of the Almighty. It would be refreshing indeed that if we could see on television or hear on the radio the programs that tell about nature and the natural world, especially the ones we can see on television. If the narrators would tell us that the creatures shown with all, with all of their marvelous traits and characteristics and actions are the work of Almighty God. But generally, perhaps with some exceptions about which you may know, I don't believe I know of any, except uh, pro religious programs that give credit to God, but I'm talking about the scientific programs. You never hear them say anything about God as the Creator, but always bring in about evolution. That's very unfortunate because the average person is not aware that evolution is really not science, but mere speculation, and would be so refreshing then to hear a narrator telling about something in nature with all of its marvelous traits and characteristics that God is its creator. I have a story here from a book, one of the volumes in a set of books. This is volume 13 of In Modern it's the, the set is called Modern Eloquence. And in Modern Eloquence, volume 13, pages 77 and 78, there's an interesting story. I'm glad to have this set of books. It's a very fine set of books, though a little older than maybe the average books that we have, dating back to around the turn of the century or a little while thereafter. But this story is in volume 13 on pages 77 and 78 by William Jennings Bryan. I believe Mr. Bryan ran for president three times, and he was the Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson and out of his conscientious feelings about the United States getting into World War I he resigned from that high office because he opposed getting into the war. He was a very, very religious man, a very eloquent man, one of the greatest orators of all time. And this is what he says in this, on this particular, in this particular book on pages 77 and 78. I'm going to read what he said. I was eating a piece of watermelon some months ago, and was struck with its beauty. I took some of the seeds and dried them and weighed them and found that it would require some 5,000 seeds to weigh a pound. And then I applied mathematics to that 40-pound melon. One of these seeds put into the ground when warmed by the sun and moistened by the rain 
takes off its coat and goes to work. It gathers more, it gathers, excuse me, it gathers from somewhere 200,000 times its own weight. Now you think about that. I'm commenting now on what Mr. Ryan said. This little watermelon seed, very light, placed in the moist earth underneath the warm sun, will gather from somewhere 200,000 times its own weight and forces this raw material, I'm reading again now from Mr. Bryan, and forces this raw material through a tiny stem and constructs a watermelon. In fact, that one seed, I might add, and I am a watermelon planter and grower. I planted one of my grandsons and I and my daughter planted uh, three kinds of watermelons last week, and we're going to plant some more this afternoon. And I might add that that one seed may produce several watermelons on the same vine which that one seed produces. But Mr. Bryan is here referring to just one seed constructing a watermelon. Just suppose it constructs or produces one watermelon. That is fantastic within itself. So he goes on and says, it ornaments the outside with a covering of green, and the inside, or inside the green, it puts a layer of white, and within the white, a core of red, and all through the red, it scatters seeds, each one capable of continuing the work of reproduction. <clears throat> then Mr. Bryan asks some very serious and sobering questions. Isn't it amazing that we see so many things that are so common to us that we just take for granted? But just a common watermelon is overwhelming evidence of God's work and God's existence. So he adds some questions. Who drew the plan by which that little seed works? Where does that little seed get its tremendous strength? Where does that little seed find its coloring matter? How does that little seed collect its flavoring extract? Next time you eat some watermelon, think about these questions. You say, it tastes good. Well, where did the taste come from? It's sweet. It looks pretty. It's red, unless you eat a yellow meated watermelon and they're very good too. And so these are serious questions, as even though they're simple and refer to something <coughs> which, excuse me, <coughs> which we may take for granted, they're very profound, and they're overwhelming to us as if we stop and really think about it. So where does it get its coloring matter? How does it collect its flavoring extract? How does it develop a watermelon? And then Mr. Bryan adds, until you can explain a watermelon, do not be too sure that you can set limits to the power of the Almighty and say just what He would do or how He would do it. I like that story. It's simple, yet very profound, and should cause anybody to realize that a watermelon itself, the facts concerning a watermelon, are truly creation science. Paul 
A. Bartz, B-A-R-T-Z, is editor of Bible Science Newsletter and also the author of little booklets called Creation Moments. And these are also on tapes. And from the March 1988 edition, I want to note something from Paul Bartz on the strange behavior of orchids. There are between 10,000 and 15,000 species of orchids. And while you surely are not familiar with all of them, it sounds very strange to talk about or orchid behavior. That would sound strange, wouldn't it? I would agree with Paul here. Such, he goes on and says, such a huge variety of orchids offers a lot of different flower shapes, colors, and sizes, each completely fitting to the bees, butterflies, bats, moths, flies, and birds which are involved in orchid pollination. Those orchids which use birds as pollinators have no scent but offer the brightest of colors, appealing to the bird's strongest sense. Evolutionists call this co-evolution, but giving it a name doesn't explain it. How did these orchids know that the bird's strongest sense is sight? And how were these orchids able to perform genetic recombination upon themselves in order to develop such colors. No giving something a scientific name doesn't make naturalistic claims any more scientific. Now what he's saying is just because you give something a scientific name doesn't explain it. That's just a cop-out. He goes on and says, Consider the bee orchid, which actually offers a flower which looks like a female bee. In order to attract male bees to a position which will load them with pollen. Now, I'm confident that you're familiar with the word pollen, but in case you're not, that just means that little fine dust on the flower, which constitutes the male reproductive cell. And so he's talking about reproduction here and pollination process. He goes on and says, How can it be scientific to suggest that a plant purposely restructured itself to fool bees into pollinating it? If evolution occurred, that's exactly what happened. The flower shaped itself so it would attract a bee, made itself look like a bee, a female bee. But we can answer easily the question God, concerning God's work in it, because God certainly could do that and did do that. God has purposely made it impossible to explain the creation without Him, not just so that we would see that He is real, but His purpose is much greater. God seeks a personal relationship with us and has made that possible through the saving work of the Son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. It is to Christ that He would ultimately draw our attention, and that's a good application of the orchid that shapes itself like a female bee, attracting the male bees. Paul Bartz continues from the same little booklet, the March 1988 edition of Creation Moments, on page 14, about the vine that keeps pet butterflies. 
two groups of tropical vines rely on the only known species of pollen-eating butterfly to reproduce. <clears throat> Neither vine has very showy flowers, nor do their flowers have any scent. But they don't need to attract pollinators because the heliconius butterfly depends on the pollen produced by the vines for its food. So the butterflies don't go very far from their food source. Since the butterfly depends on the pollen, the vine, the vines produce more male, many more male flowers than female so that its army of pollinators is well fed. Now, isn't that amazing? Being messy eaters, the butterflies end up with pollen all over them. But what would attract the butterfly to the female flower, which can be up to 20 feet away? Two different tricks are used here. First, now carefully note this. This is the genius of the Almighty on display. This is not chance. That's a weak cop-out to say this is just all by chance through some kind of evolutionary process. Later I'll show you that many great scientists who are evolutionists, and one from which I shall quote particularly, admit that evolution is not science, but merely speculation. So he goes on and says, after asking what would attract the butterfly to the female flower, so this butterfly with all these male pollen grains on it could carry these male pollen grains to the female flower and thus cause reproduction process to begin. What would attract the butterfly? to the female flower, which can be up to 20 feet away. Two different tricks are used here. First, a female flower usually grows very close to where a male flower has just withered. Secondly, the female flower, while producing no pollen, looks just like the male flower, in order to invite the butterfly's attention. So it poses as another male flower, and the butterfly is attracted to that and carries the pollen that's already on it to another flower which turns out to be really a female flower, looking like a male flower. We are really struck by the intelligence in this arrangement, and I certainly agree with Mr. Bartz there. He goes on and says, if only chance were involved, why would the only known species of pollen-eating butterfly be found with the only known vines which rely on their services? Well, even that is obvious evidence of design. No wonder those seraphims to which I referred in other lessons described in Isaiah chapter 6 said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory, even down to just a very common thing in nature called a butterfly. There is overwhelming evidence of how true those seraphims were in saying that the whole earth is full of God's glory. Mr. Bartz goes on and says, This is a mighty big planet. And why should these vines offer female flowers which look like the males so that they will be pollinated if there is no design, no designer? It is so clear that these butterflies were custom-made for these things. 
or for these vines. And the vines were made for the butterflies. Now anybody with reason and common sense, and as my mother used to say and others where I grew up, anybody with a grain of gumption could see clearly that this is a designed matter. And so it is so clear that these butterflies were custom made for these vines. And the vines were made for the butterflies. And that witnesses is to a personal creator who is personally involved in the life on planet Earth. Another little book, this one written by James A. Tucker, entitled From uh, rather, Windows on God's World. And this is an amazing little book. And on page four, he says something about things growing out of the ground. I'm a gardener, and all of this is very interesting to me and amazing indeed. And so he starts out by saying, or asking a question. Do you know what happens when you plant a bulb upside down? I wonder if you've thought about trying to answer that question. Does the part that usually grows up instead grow down if you place it in the ground upside down? And do the roots which would ordinarily grow downward, do they grow upward? He answers that question. A plant must have its roots planted firmly in the ground to collect the soil's nutrients. And its leaves must be exposed to the sun's light the plant seems to know this automatically because whether it is a bulb or a seed, the roots always grow downward while the stem and leaves always grow upward. Question, why? The only reasonable, sensible answer to that even if you didn't have a Bible and never heard of one, would be that there has to be a designer in this and that intelligence is involved in this, that this is the work of a creator. And so he adds, when the bulb is planted upside down, the roots will grow out of the top and quickly begin growing downward even though they come up out of the bottom of the bulb, but it's turned bottom side up, so they grow upward and then start turning and grow downward as they're supposed to. And the stem that is coming out at the, on the bottom because the bulb is bottom side up will grow out of the bottom and then turn upward. First it grows downward and curves and then goes upward. And before long, the action of roots and stem will twist the bulb around to an upright position as it should have been in the first place. Now, I don't recommend that you plant your bulbs this way, but given them enough time, they will do this. Just to think about that, the power of life in this bulb that God Almighty made, that power of life is such that the stem growing and the roots growing will turn it up in the right direction. Toadstools that grow from the ceilings of damp underground tunnels will have curved stems. At first they will grow downward, but as soon as their stems are long enough, 
to allow a turn, they curve upward to be in the position they would have, have been in above the ground or on the floor of the tunnel. You might, uh, James Tucker goes on to say, you might want to try an experiment that demonstrates geotrophism. That is, this principle we're talking about, plants, the leaves and stem going upward and the roots growing downward. Take a dried bean and keep it moist until it sprouts. Then turn it upside down and place it between two pieces of glass with soil and water to keep it moist. Soon the root will turn downward as it should. Now turn it over. Take the glass, the pieces of glass, and just turn it over and watch the root change again. As many times as you do this, the roots will persist in growing downward. The seed will not allow you to confuse it. I think that's a great demonstration of the work of God Almighty out there in what we call nature. Sometimes we just say Mother Nature when we ought to be saying it's the work of God. And it's all right to call it nature, but recognize that nature is the work of God. And I want us to note now some insects. And I want to show you some of these from a book which I wrote. I think I've showed this book to you before, entitled Evolution in the Light of Scripture, Science, and Sense. I have in this book one chapter on the whole earth is full of God's glory. And in this chapter, I've taken a few of these examples, illustrations of how this is true, that the whole earth is full of God's glory. And we can see that as we look around in the world of nature. For example, I tell in this book about locusts. The female locust flies to a tree and takes a little ovipositor, it's called, like a little butcher knife in its body, and makes a little slit place in the bark of the tree and lays its eggs and flies away, leaving the eggs to hatch, as far as anybody knows, never attending to them after this. When the eggs hatch, the little larvae crawl down like little worms down the bark of the tree and go into the ground. And they live on the succulent juices of the roots, which they apparently enjoy very much. And 17 years later, some of these locusts that are known as 17-year locusts, 17 years later, they come up out of the ground sometimes to on the very day, 17 years to the very day from the time they went into the ground. Now there's not any need to try to convince me that that just happened. My beloved, this is the work of God. Then we turn attention to a butterfly known as the Maculina Arian. And this butterfly called Maculina Arian, is a remarkable creature indeed. It goes through a fantastic life cycle. A fellow of London Zoological Society, therefore obviously one of the great scientists of the world, otherwise he wouldn't be a fellow of London Zoological Society in London, England. His name, Dr. Douglas de Ware and that is pronounced Dewar, according to some, maybe Dewar by some, but I think it's properly pronounced Dewar, D-E, capital W-A-R. And he has reported on this marvelous creature. Also, Dr. Bolton David Heiser 
has given a report on Dr. DeWire's comments on this amazing butterfly in his book, Evolution and Christian Faith. Dr. DeWire quotes Jeffrey Taylor and says that Taylor said in a broadcast in Ireland in 1948 that it was the life cycle of Maculina Arian, which means a large blue butterfly, that first shook his faith in the whole evolutionary setup. Here was a strong, staunch evolutionist that admitted that when he studied the Maculina Arian, his faith in the whole evolutionary system was shaken just because of what he observed in the life cycle of this beautiful, wonderful butterfly. The female Maculina Arian, after mating with a male, lays its eggs on the buds of a wild thyme bush, thyme, T-H-Y-M-E. When each egg hatches, each caterpillar, little worm-like larva, eats the flowers of the thyme for about three weeks, during which time it molts or loses its skin or coat three times. It puts off its outer covering, grows another one, puts that off, grows another one, puts that on, uh, puts that off, and then grows another one, a third one. That's in three weeks. And then it leaves the thyme plant and never eats vegetable food again. It goes out on the ground near the thyme bush and starts looking for a certain ant, certain kind of ant. It ain't been ant hunting before. It hasn't been to school to learn how to find a certain type of ant. But when it finds that particular type of ant, that ant seems to recognize that it's supposed to come up to that larva, that little baby Maculina arian, and with its antennae, those little structures on the ant's head, it taps and strikes on the body of the Maculina arian larva. And when it does, the little larva of the Maculina arian secretes a kind of milk from its tenth segment. And out of this, the ant eats it, that secretion, he eats the secretion, lolls in that luxury, the record says, for about an hour. And then he, the little larvae raises its back or humps up its back and the ant gets astride it and takes it in its jaws and goes down into the ant's nest underground. And the other ants gather around and they love that sweet milk too. And so they start drinking that milk from the tenth segment of the Maculina arian larva. But they must feed this little fella in order for it to produce milk. Just like a cow. If you milk a cow, you've got to feed her if she keeps producing milk. Otherwise, she'll go dry, as we used to say on the farm. And so they feed this little Maculina larvae, and they feed baby ants to it, their own babies, plenty of them anyway, it seems, they might think, and so they feed this little fella baby ants, and it produces milk and produces more milk, and finally, it quits producing milk, even though it's been eating 
plenty. It goes through this life cycle just like a cow. We'll go through the cycle of quit producing milk and then goes through a season and then produces another calf and the milk starts again. And so here this little Macalena Arian is placed in a special little nook in the ant nest underground and lies there for several weeks and in the month of June, so the records tell us, it comes out, crawls up to the top of the ground through the little channel, through the ant hole, and climbs out on the surface of the earth and stretches out its new wings and flies away. It mates with a male and goes and lays eggs on the thyme bush and they hatch and the cycle starts all over again. Beloved, that is an amazing thing in nature which ought to be very convincing to us about the wonders of the work of God. One more that I want to give you in this particular lesson, termites. Now, we don't like termites, but they do have a good purpose. In the forests, they eat the old wood, the dead wood that falls, and they turn it back, as it were, into the soil. But we don't like them when they get in our houses and eat us out of house and home, so to speak. And cellulose is an astoundingly stable chemical compound. I'm taking this also from my book, Evolution in the Light of Scripture, Science, and Sense, just as I have these other matters about which I've spoken. Without termites, the vegetative growth and decay cycle <coughs> excuse me, would be unbalanced with bad results, especially in the tropics. Believe it or not, termites have made a vital contribution in the purpose of God in the balance of the natural world. Instinct is a word which we mortals use as a convenient label with which we try to cloak our immense ignorance. Every termite is locked in the confines of the mysterious thing which biologists arbitrarily call instinct. It is all right to call it instinct as long as we realize that it is really the work of the Almighty God who created all things, including termites. Termites are relatively small, but in their intestinal tracts there are little parasite creatures that are so small we call them minute creatures. They're microscopic one-cell protozoa animals, and these enable the termite to, di to digest wood. They produce a, an enzyme that helps the termite to digest wood, and in doing this, the protozoan parasites eat part of the cellulose substances, and so they work in a sort of sharing of the food or this endeavor of the termites and these protozoan creatures. Experiments have been made where termites have been treated or heated, I should have said, to 97 degrees Fahrenheit without killing them. However, these in a few days soon thereafter, that is, die. That is, the termites die. The 97 degrees temperature didn't kill them. They survive a few days, short time, and then they die. And the reason they die, they starve to death because the 97 degrees temperature did kill the parasites in their intestines. 
Everything suggests that termites and the protozoa in them are mutually dependent. Neither can get along without the other. This is another scientific refutation of the evolutionary hypothesis. How did either ever exist without the other? This is more creation science, that is, scientific facts which lend support to the idea that God created everything. According to the implications of the doctrines of evolution, termites and their parasites would have had to have evolved at the same time for either one of them to exist. All that science knows about these creatures shows that they have always existed together and have always depended on each other. Reason says these were created together by the all-wise and all-powerful God about whom we read in the Bible. More next time. Thank you very much.